I would like to share a little bit about this wonderful writer you're about to meet. Her name is Marty Rhodes Figley, and she's the author of 17 historical novels for children. I'm personally thrilled that I got to introduce her because as a child, this genre was my absolute favorite type of books. I love hearing stories that gave me insight into the past and allowed me to glance into the lives of children and adults from other eras. Ms. Figley was born in Joplin, Missouri, but grew up in Springfield. She spent much of her time visiting relatives in Hannibal, where her parents grew up. As a child, she was torn about what she wanted to be when she grew up. Did she want to help like Florence Nightingale, or did she want to be a reporter like Lois Lane of Superman fame? Ms. Figley graduated from Molly Mount Holyoke College, the alma mater of another childhood heroine, Emily Dickinson. She had always wanted to help people, but the, her passion was writing. So what was a girl to do? Ms. Figley, as it turned out, was able to accomplish both. Her first career was as an x-ray technician. She got to help a lot of people that way. Then she became a mom. Now that's really a helping profession. While her children were little, she tried quilting, painting, making dolls, and photography, but still felt a strong desire to write. Her first book, The Story of Zacchaeus, was written in 1995, and she's been writing ever since. Not only has she written several books for children, she has also had fictional pieces published in numerous periodicals. She is currently working on the children's book entitled Washington is Burning. She's appeared nationally speaking to children in seven school, several schools, both locally and afar. Please join me in welcoming our wonderful author, Marty Rhodes Figley. Many books take years to come to fruition. This one's genesis was 43 years ago. It started with this dog and this dress dog in this dress. I remember it well. I was young and in love. My boyfriend was going to take me to meet his favorite uncle, uncle and aunt in Delaware. So I fixed my hair, put my lipstick on, put on my best white dress. We drove to Delaware. My uncle opened the door and there to greet me beside my uncle, his uncle, was Lon Derry, a 180 pound Newfoundland. Well, Lon Derry was so glad to see me, he licked my hand and my white dress, he rubbed his fur against me and my white dress, and after about five seconds, this white dress was covered with slobber and dog hair, so much for making a good impression. But there's a happy end to that part of the story. I married my boyfriend. I became best friends with the aunt and uncle. And Lon Derry was my favorite dog for many, many years. Newfoundlands are large dogs. They were originally um, named for the, they're originally discovered by British settlers. They're named for the island of Newfoundland. They were uh, used on sailing ships to rescue people. That's why they had these dark, these dense coats to protect them from the icy waters of the sea. They also have something called a wet mouth, and that means they drool a lot. But they're kind, strong, brave, courageous dogs. But at that point in the white dress, I really was not too happy with him. There's a second part to the story of how my newest book, Emily and Carlo, came. That's the Newfoundland. That's the first part. The second part happened when I went back to school. I decided that I wanted to finish my college education um, late in life. I'd been sitting in a class at Northern Virginia Community College, and the professor said that Mount Holyoke, Smith, and Wellesley had uh, great programs for non-traditional students. So I went, well, I'm having a little lull in my publishing career, and I thought I was tempted. I went home and mentioned it to my husband, and I was so surprised when he said, why don't you do it? <laughs> uh, the colleges were in Massachusetts. I thought, whoa. But I, I did. I chose Mount Holyoke. Here's a picture of it. It kind of looks like something out of Harry Potter. But uh, it was founded in 1837, so it's a pretty old school. But the cool thing about it was it was the alma mater of Emily Dickinson. She attended that school when she's a teenager. 
And the second year I was in class, I decided to take a class on Emily Dickinson in Amherst at her home because that's very tempting. How often do you get to take a class in a famous person's home? And this is her home in Amherst. And this is the bedroom where she wrote a lot of her famous poetry. So what did I think I knew about Emily Dickinson at that time? Well, I knew she lived from 1830 to 1856. I knew she stayed in her parents' home most of her life. She never married. She seemed to not care for worldly things. This is what I thought I knew. Uh, she uh, stayed in her room and wrote gorgeous, lyrical poetry about love, death, and immortality while wearing a spotless white dress. That's what I thought I knew. Well, on the first day of class, our professor took us on a walking tour of Amherst. And about two steps into that tour, she said, Emily Dickinson owned a Newfoundland named Carlo for 16 years. Well, <laughs> I just about, I, I couldn't believe it. I remembered this, and I remembered this, and my perception of Emily Dickinson changed immediately. Number one, that wet white dress was not spotless when she was writing her poetry. Not if she lived with something like this for 16 years. So right then and there, I decided I wanted to find out more about this poet and her love of her dog. And I love dogs, and I just wanted to share this with children. And so that's what I decided to do. And let me tell you a little more about Emily. What was she like as a young girl? She had beautiful dark red hair. In fact, the museum in Amherst has a lock of it. It is the most gorgeous, deep red. You can't tell it in this picture, but she, she had big brown eyes. She was very clever. She had lots of friends as a teenager. Her dad gave her Carlo when she was around 19 years old, probably for protection and also to keep her company. Um, Here's another thing about Emily. She was popular, she was clever, but sometimes she was hard on her friends. She, if, when you read about somebody or want to learn by, about somebody in the past, you know what, how you can find out? You can find out by reading their letters. Back then there was no telephones. There were, there, people wrote letters even to people across town. And I'm gonna read you a letter Emily wrote to one of her friends, and this kind of tells you how she was with her friends. She needed a lot of attention and reassurance. This was written to a Beirut in 1848. She said, slowly, very slowly, I came to the conclusion that you had forgotten me, and I tried hard to forget you. But your image still haunts me and tantalized me with fond recollections. If you never received my letter, then may, may you think yourself wronged and rightly. But if you don't want to be my friend any longer, say so. And I'll try once more to blot you from my memory. Tell me very soon, for suspense is intolerable. I need not tell you, this is from Emily. <laughs> so Emily was a little hard on her friends. Uh, her letters show her talent with her poetry and her words, but they also show that she was lonely. She had an underlying loneliness. So when she got Carlo, dogs are always there for you. They never let you down. Carlo was her constant companion. Uh, oh, one other thing. Let me read another thing uh, her literary mentor Thomas Wentworth Higginson described her. This is another thing about Emily. I never was with anyone who drained my nerve power so much. Without touching her, she drew from me. I'm glad not to live near her. So this gal needed a dog. This gal needed a dog. And she had him for 16 years. He probably weighed over 100 pounds, so he gave her the confidence to explore the countryside and to visit friends in town. And he was her confidant, her playmate, her friend, her protector, and uh, I just think he made a very big difference in her life. A friend recalled her companion out of doors was a large Newfoundland named Carlo. 
Now I'd like to read you a little out of my book, the story of this poet and her big dog. I just read parts of it. In a small New England town lived a shy, smart girl named Emily. She loved reading and she loved writing, especially poetry. Home was where she was happiest, but the winter Emily turned 19, the Dickinson house seemed empty. Her sister had gone away to school at Ipswich Academy. Her brother was immersed in college, and so she wrote to a friend, I am all alone. Emily's father knew she was sad. That same winter, he gave her a large, lively puppy. When they first met, the puppy covered Emily's face with dog kisses. She laughed. Emily named him Carlo after a dog in one of her favorite books. They made a strange pair, one giant dog and one slight girl. Emily wrote to a friend, you ask me of my companions, Hill, sir, and the sundown, and a dog large as myself that my father bought me. And I imagine he did pull her around quite a bit. I don't even know if he was on a leash, but I, I don't know. With Carlo by her side, she had the confidence to explore the world around her. And there she is having, distributing some of her home-baked goods. Emily was actually a very good cook. She did all the cooking in the Dickinson family. She even won a prize for her Indian rye bread at the state fair. So she was quite a good cook. Do you think she gave uh, Carlo some of those cookies? I bet Carlo got them one way or the other. <laughs> Austin married and moved next door to the Evergreens. I uh, volunteered at the Evergreens for one semester, and it's virtually untouched from when, when they live there. It's, it's, like a time, it, it's like a time machine. It's an amazing thing. They walked between the path, between the two houses. It was just wide enough for two who love. Emily and Carlo spent many happy evenings there. A friend remembered Emily arriving at Austin's house with her dog and lantern, often at the piano playing weird and beautiful melodies. Carlo played with the children. And they visited the frog pond. And my guess is she got wet because noofs get in the water, then they shake, and then you know what happens. So, on summer afternoons, Emily and Carlo stayed at home. After the chores were done, they sat on the porch listening to the bobolinks and Robin song. Emily brushed his tangles from his shaggy coat. She wrote a poem about the make-believe trip to the ocean. It began, I started early, took my dog, and visited the sea. The mermaids in the basement came out to look at me. Emily shared her hopes and her dreams and her poetry. Carlo listened like a good friend should. I talk of these things with Carlo and his eyes grow meaning and his shaggy feet keep a slower face. Emily wrote, the dog is the noblest work of art. His mistress writes, he doth defend. She called him her shaggy ally. She had to go to Philadelphia twice because she had an eye problem and Carlo couldn't go. She wrote, Carlo did not come because he would die in jail. I can't imagine Carlo being in a little townhouse room. But finally, she was re reunited with him. Carlo leaned against his best friend, decorating her clothes with dog hair. She bent down and kissed his wet nose. She never left him again. As the years passed, Carlo's walk slowed. His muzzle turned gray. When it was time for Carlo to leave this life, it was hard to say goodbye. Emily wrote a friend the sad short letter. Carlo died, E. Dickinson, would you instruct me now? She missed her best friend. He was the only dog she ever owned. After Carlo was gone, Emily stayed close at home, but the town, the woods, and the meadows, and Carlo lived on in Emily's poetry. Twas my one glory, let it be remembered, I was owned of thee. So it was, it was, she acutely grieved when Car Carlo died. After his death, she wrote her friend Thomas Higginson, telling him she missed her dog. Six months later, she wrote about him again. She said, I wish for Carlo. Emily stayed closer to home after her beloved dog died. She wrote, I explore little since my mute confederate. 
Emily Dickinson is sometimes hard for kids to understand. Her love of her dog is not. I wanted to write a book that showed the poet in a more earthy light. She was a person who loved a very large, messy, hairy, slobbery dog for 16 years. He was her playmate, friend, guide, and companion. Her dresses probably showed evidence of this relationship. One last thing, a friend reminisced that as a little girl, she went walking with the poet while her huge dog stalked solemnly beside them. Emily confided to her young companion, Gracie, do you know that I believe the first to come and greet me when I go to heaven will be this dear, faithful old friend, Carlo? I hope so. It was a privilege to write about Emily and her dog and to share this story with young readers. Sometimes are the, the best stories are the ones you have to wait for. So thank you. <laughs> I think I've got about three minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. How did you choose your illustrator? Because the drawings are beautiful. I am blessed. Catherine Stock lives in France. They chose her. She was available. Every picture is a work of art in this book. Her book should be. She's an avid fan of, of uh, Emily and wanted to portray her in a strong way, not like, not prissy. And I think she did a marvelous job. And I'm so grateful for these these uh, illustrations. Anybody else? Well, I, oh yes. Oh well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>